turn with you tonight to the uh, letter of the Epistle of James. The Epistle of James. And uh, we want to read at chapter 5. The Epistle of James, and we're at chapter 5. Verse 1, it says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have reaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the heart of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and been wanton, ye have nourished your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. James rebukes here the rich and the powerful for their love of money and their attitude to the poor, verse 4 to 6. He also addresses those believers who have been suffering at the hands of their rich employers, and he exhorts them to be patient. For he says, you know, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The coming of the Lord would be a time of release of these saints from suffering and from ill treatment. Many years ago, when I was just a boy, I remember being taken in a car from Lisburn up through Mara. And as we entered into the village of Mara, Those of you who know it and have traveled through it, there's a wall, a gray wall, just as you enter into it, and it says on that wall, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. This text that we have here in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verse 8. I was through Mara just recently, probably I think the beginning of last week. And as I entered into Mara, on that wall, these words were written, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James chapter 5, verse 8. And so all those years, that text, has been written on that wall, reminding people who pass through the village of Mara that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And you might say to me, well, it has been there a long time, and so it has. And you might say to me tonight, well, you know, you men who believe in these sorts of things You've been preaching these things for years. You've been preaching them for a long time. And so we have. But remember that Noah preached for 120 years. He preached that God would send the flood and destroy the world. And he pointed the people to the ark. And that's exactly just what we're doing Tonight, Noah preached 120 years about the coming of the judgment, and my, we want again to look at this text tonight, to to leave this text before you this evening, that the coming 
of the Lord draweth nigh. When you look at the world in which we live, my, uh, there's no shame and sin anymore. Things have waxed worse and worse. The world gets worse and more defiled and corrupt with sin and terrible sins I'm talking about every day. And dear friends, it can't go on like this very much longer. Something will have to happen. And I believe that the thing that will happen will be the coming of the Lord, because the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I want to just to pass on a few thoughts about this text tonight. My, the Savior promised his coming. He promised his coming. You know, at Christmas, somebody told me today, it's only eight weeks to Christmas. My, what a shock. Only eight weeks to Christmas. But you know, every Christmas, we celebrate Christ's first advent. When he came into the world through the virgin's womb to be the Savior. And my, you know, the Lord promised that he would come a second time. Remember, he said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And this is the promise of his coming, and it came from the Savior's own lips. It was he who gave the promise. And my, he always keeps his word. He never fails to keep a promise. And many believe that the time is at hand when the Lord will come. In the Old Testament, there are many promises and prophecies concerning his first advent, and all these were fulfilled when he was born at Bethlehem. Just as the promises concerning his first advent were fulfilled, so will the promises concerning his second advent be fulfilled. Why would one set of promises be fulfilled and the others not fulfilled? The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The Savior promised his coming. You know, the Scriptures proclaim his coming. We read about the Lord's return in nearly every book of the New Testament. Not only did the Lord promise that he would return, but the New Testament writers confirmed it. The doctrine of the Lord's return is part of the apostles' doctrine. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul uh, s s said to the Corinthians, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. And there my, we have Paul reminding us that his coming is near, the moment of his coming. When he writes to the Philippians, he says in chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we belong to. Those of us who know the Lord, that is. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change this vile body, that it might be like unto his glorious body. In 1 Thessalonians, again, we have the Scriptures proclaiming his coming. My Paul says, you know, ye turn to God from idols. He's reminding them about that day when they could see it. Ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. And he says in that great Scripture that we all love in chapter 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. John, in his epistle, John says, you know, 
Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You see, the Scriptures proclaim his coming. You know, usually when people want proof of something, they like it to be in writing. Somebody enters into an agreement or a contract, they put it in writing. Well, here we have the writings of holy men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and they wrote these things under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And you know, friends, the Savior promised his coming, and the Scriptures proclaim his coming. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And then we find this out, that the signs point to his coming. We're always looking for signs. And the signs around us and the signs of the time point us to the Lord's return. My, you remember that Peter, in his second epistle, he said, you know that there shall come in the last days mockers, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were since the beginning of the age. And people are looking for signs. Show me the signs. Give me the proof that Christ is coming again. Remember, his disciples said this to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24. They said, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And that's a very interesting chapter to write because the Lord had many <coughs> things to say to them. And he told them, my, that the signs were pointing to his near return. He didn't tell them the date. He didn't tell them the day. He told them to look for the signs. I wonder, are you looking for the signs tonight? Family went to London to see the Queen opening Parliament, and they got up early and got a good vantage point. And, uh, you know, the traffic was just flowing normally. And then after a while, after a good while, it began to slow down, and then uh, the road was closed. So they got up off their seat, and they could see that, that something must be going to happen. And then the police outriders appeared, and they went down the road, and they saw these signs, and those signs told them that something was about to happen. The queen was on her way. And dear friends, the signs of these days are telling us that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That's what they're telling us about. My things that Jesus told would happen are happening today. We find he talked about famines and diseases and earthquakes in uh, Luke 17 and Matthew 6 and 7. My, he talked about the days of Noah he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of God. You know, the days of Noah were days of sinfulness. Days of sinfulness. The days of Noah were days of wickedness. The days of Noah there were days of ungodliness. My, it tells us in Genesis that God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That was about back in the days of Noah. Sure, couldn't you say that about the world in which you and I live in tonight? That the wickedness of man is great in the earth. When you read some of the things that IS have done and others have done, these groups have done, tells us way back there that the earth was corrupt before God. 
is the world in which we live not corrupt before God. And the world was filled with violence, as it was in the days of Noah. And of course, it goes on to talk about the days of Lot. The days of Lot. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of God. Lot lived in Sodom, and Sodom was a place of unnatural love. Unnatural love. You don't need to be a genius to work out what that is. And Sodom, my dear friends, it was a place of uncontrolled lust. And that's the day in which we live. And Sodom, men longed for men. And Sodom brought his daughters, and off, or um, Lot brought his daughters, and offered them. They weren't interested. Dear friends, in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, people had only time for themselves, eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but that's the things they were taken up with. They had no place for God. They had no time for God. And the Lord is making the comparison between the days of Noah and the days of Lot and the days in which we live. And these things tell us that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Paul, remember, talks about the people who will live in the last days. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And if you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, you'll see the list and the description of the people that live in the last days. My, we see from the saints. My, the Savior promised his coming, and the Scriptures proclaim his coming, and the signs point to his coming. And you know, friends, the saints long for his coming. The saints long for his coming, the second coming of Christ, one of the great truths that thrills the soul of the child of God. Paul refers to it as the blessed hope of the believer. And he says we should be living each day looking for that blessed hope. He says, you know, my, the grace of God that brought salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us the denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's how we should live, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Believer, is that how you and I are living tonight? Are we living with that blessed hope in view? And the saints are longing and looking for the coming of the Lord. Now what? When it happens, it will happen in a moment, we're told, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. There'll be no announcement on the 10 o'clock news. There'll be no advertisement in the newspaper. There'll be no article written by the column writers. It will happen when the world is least expecting it to come. People will go about their business as they were in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. They'll be eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage. My dear friends, and the Lord will come when he's least expected to come. It will be the moment of resurrection. The dead in Christ, it says, shall rise first. I was walking through a graveyard on Friday with another pastor. We were conducting a funeral down in Lisburn. And I said to him, you know, wouldn't it be interesting for people who are walking through a cemetery or a graveyard like we are today 
when the Lord would come, my, what a shock they would get when the graves started to open. In the moment, dear friends, it will be the moment of resurrection. The body that has gone into corruption, that body of the believer, will be raised in incorruption. What a moment that will be. It will be the moment not only of resurrection, it will be the moment of removal, because it says not only will the dead in Christ rise first, but we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those who know the Lord and are alive at that moment, they'll be just caught up like pins into a magnet. My, we read of Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. And that would suggest to me that there was people going about looking for Enoch. They couldn't find him. He just disappeared all of a sudden. And that's what's going to happen. People will not be found because God had translated him. It may be at morn when the day is awaking. It may be perchance at the blackness of midnight that Jesus will come in, in the fullness of glory to receive from the world his own. It will be the moment of resurrection. It will be the moment of removal. It will be the moment of release. We're leaving this world of pain and sorrow and tears. We're leaving it for a better land. It will be the moment of reunion. My dear friends, we're going to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be reunited with those that we love and those that we know who have gone before us. And you know what will be the moment of revelation? It says, to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, the Lord that we're going to meet is the Lord who came from heaven to be our Savior. The one who left the ivory palaces above and Step down through the womb of the Blessed Virgin, the Lord who came into the world to be our Savior, the Lord that we're going to meet is the Lord who went to the cross to die for our sins, to shed his blood that we might be redeemed, the one who hung on Calvary's tree and suffered as a sacrifice for sin, and bore our sins and paid the penalty at Calvary. And the Lord that we're going to meet is the Lord who satisfied God's demands and on the third day rose again to be a living Savior who's able to meet people at the point of their need and save their souls for all eternity. And the Lord who we're going to meet, dear friends, is the one who's able to save the man or woman or young person that comes and put their trust in him. What a moment it will be when the Savior comes. It's the moment the saints long for. It's the moment. It's the, it's the uh, promise of his coming. Jesus talked about his coming. We see the uh, proof of his coming. The Scriptures proclaim his coming. The signs point to his coming, and now we find that the saints long for his coming. And I finish with this thought tonight, that sinners dread his coming. Sinners dread his coming. One of the things that speak to one saved people loudly, probably more than anything else, is their need to be saved. Because in the second coming of Christ, they know that if they're not saved, they'll be left behind. 
and how many testimonies we've heard of people, and God spoke to them and convicted them and challenged them and told them that my, uh, they, they needed to prepare lest he would come. When Jesus comes, the door will be shut. The day of grace will be ended, and people know that Christ is coming suddenly. They know it's going to be suddenly in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You remember the Lord Jesus says, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Dear friends, they know it will be unexpectedly. There will be no prior warning. And you see, sinners dread his coming because they know if they go to bed tonight in their sins and they're not saved, and if Jesus comes before tomorrow, that those that they love and know, those of the family who belong to Christ, will rise to meet the Savior. But those that are not ready will be left behind to face the judgment of God. I was reading a book uh, by Sam Doherty recently, and he told a story in the book about a businessman and his chauffeur. And the businessman was well on in age. He had been very successful in business. His wife had passed away some years now. He had no family, there had no family. He was left alone in the big mansion. And this man was his chauffeur who drove him to work and drove him from work and to any meetings he had to attend. And one evening they were driving home from work and the chauffeur was driving his boss and the man said from the back seat, John, he said, you know, when the Lord comes, he said, you know, you can have all my cars. He said, John, I'll not need them again because the Lord's coming and I'm going to heaven to be with him and you can have all my cars. And John said, sir, that's great. Man, that's very kind of you. So they drove on and they entered into the avenue that lay uh, at the road where he went down to his home, and as they entered into the avenue down to the big mansion, the businessman said, John, he said, you know, when the Lord comes, there's only me living here, and you, can, you and your wife can have my home because I'll not need it. I'm going to my eternal home in heaven. And John, you and your wife can have my home. In fact, he says, John, you can have my money too. And John, my, couldn't believe what his ears was hearing. And he said, my, sir, that's great. So John went home and told his wife, and she was over the moon. My, she thought it was great. And so they talked about it that night. But you know, friends, that night when they went to bed, John couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep. John had no peace. And he got up in the middle of the night around 3 o'clock in the morning. He gets on his clothes, gets into the car, goes down to his boss's home to the mansion, and he wraps the, the door at 3 o'clock in the morning. And his boss looks out through the window and he said, My goodness, John, what are you doing here? And he said, Sir, you need to let me in. I need to talk. And so the man wondered what was going on, so he lets him in. John says, Sir, I don't want your cars. He said, Sir, I don't want your house nor your money. And the businessman said, well, John, what do you want? And John said, sir, I want to be saved. He says, because I want to be ready when the Lord comes. I want to leave with you and others when the Lord comes. And he said, sir, I'm not ready. I'm not saved. And if Jesus comes, I'll be left behind. Would you tell me how I can be ready for the Lord's return? And that night... Down in the big mansion, the businessman led John to Christ. 
Dear friends, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Are you ready? Are you ready? Our Lord is now rejected and by the world is owned, by the many still neglected and by the few enthroned, but soon he'll come in glory. The hour is drawing nigh and the crowning day is coming by and by. Dear friends, tonight, trust you're ready. Because when he comes in that moment, those of us who are will leave this scene of wickedness and sin and corruption and evil for a better, better land to be with the Savior. Make sure you'll not be left behind. Because I want to tell you this, you see, this world as it is today, it's going to be ten times worse when the Lord returns. May God speak to your heart tonight. May God move in your life. And may you bow and make sure that you're ready to meet the Savior. Amen. Amen. We're going to